Good evening. Welcome to another reading of Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. The first hour will be spent reading the text of this book, and we'll begin on the first full paragraph on page 46. And by the way, we're reading from an online version of this book so that you can read from the very same text that we're reading from. If you go to uh, just type in your search engine, Romanism and the Reformation, and one of the first selections you'll find is uh, un- uh, uh, archives.org, uh, University of Toronto. Just click on that link, and the book will come up. And then below the book, you'll find a little place where you can click on full screen, and that will make the pages easier to read. And then fast forward to page 46 simply by clicking on the pages and they will turn and when you find page 46 we'll begin in the first full paragraph about 20 percent down the page and now I'll begin the reading now we're reading from a chapter of the book entitled the Daniel foreview of Romanism the prophet Daniel foresaw the papacy, and the Roman Catholic Church in his prophecies. This is the universal belief, the unanimous belief of the Protestant reformers, that the papacy was the Antichrist of Scripture. Contrary to what is taught in all the churches today, that Antichrist will be a future single individual who will come somewhere between seven and three and a half years before Christ's literal return to earth, and that he will fulfill all the prophecies of Antichrist within that seven-year period of time, three and a half or seven-year period of time. 
This has become the orthodox teaching in the evangelical churches. It's a lie. And it was created by the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church, and it has been the orthodox teaching of the Roman Catholic Church simply for the purpose of shedding the onus or shedding the stigma of Antichrist away from the papacy and onto someone else to deceive the whole Christian world, and that's what he's done. I want to repeat something that's very, very important for us to comprehend, that all Christians before possibly three or four generations before us, all Bible-believing Christians from that time all the way back to the time of the apostles believe that whatever power, whatever authority rose up in place of the Caesars of the old pagan Roman Empire, that person would be the Antichrist. And the fulfillment of that Bible prophecy was, was, was fulfilled in history exactly the way the prophet Daniel foretold it. It is, was, and always will be the papacy, and it's time for us to comprehend this and to correct the error of modern-day Christianity and return to Bible-believing Protestantism. Futurism is a Jesuit lie. It was intended to protect the papacy from the onus and the stigma of Antichrist and to deceive the whole world into believing the papacy is the vicar of Christ or the replacement of Christ and that he is to be obeyed by every man, woman, and child on the planet. That, in fact, is the goal of the current ecumenical movement in Christianity today, to place every Christian man, woman, and child, or rather, every man, woman, and child on the planet under the authority of the papacy. And the papacy is becoming a, the king of kings and the lord of lords on the earth. As unlikely as that may sound, if you'll continue to research this matter, you'll see it, you'll see it as clearly as I do. Now we'll begin the reading. We ask then, has the papacy exhibited this mark also? Time would fail me to quote to you verbatim its great words, its boastful self-glorifications, and its outrageous blasphemies against God. You'll find pages of them quoted in my work on the approaching end of the age, and volumes filled with them exist, for papal documents consist of little else. The papal claims are so grotesque in their pride and self-exaltation that they almost produce a sense of the comic, and that feeling of pitying contempt with which one would watch a frog trying to swell itself into the size of an ox. I must, however, mention some of the claims contained in these quote-unquote great words, which will show you the nature of papal blasphemies. It is claimed, for instance, that, quote, no laws made contrary to the canon laws and the decrees of the Roman uh, prelates have any force, unquote. That, quote, the tribunals of all kings are subject to the priests, unquote. And that, quote, no man may act against the discipline of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. And that, quote, the papal decrees or decretal epistles are to be numbered among the canonical scriptures, unquote. And not only so, but that the scriptures themselves are to be received only, quote, because a judgment of the holy Pope Innocent was published for receiving them, unquote. In other words, the scriptures are only be, to be regarded because the Pope said they are to be regarded. Don't miss the point here. The papacy has made itself to be the supreme lawgiver of the world, that no law may contradict holy Roman Catholic canon law, and that the Pope has the force 
of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that even his priests have jurisdiction over the civil governments of the nations. That's some, just some of the great words, the words of blasphemy that are found consistently throughout all of the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, making the papacy the king of kings and the lord of lords on the earth. Now, the author continues. It is claimed that, quote, emperors ought to obey and not rule over pontiffs or popes, unquote. That even an awful wicked pope who is a slave of hell may not be rebuked by mortal man because, quote, he is himself to judge all men and be judged by none, unquote. And, quote, since he was styled God by the pious Prince Constantine, it is manifest that God cannot be judged by man, unquote. Now, if you carefully following along and listening to what this author says, the Pope says in writing in Roman Catholic canon law that he is God. Blasphemy of blasphemies. Let me read it again to make sure you comprehend what it says. Quote, since he was styled God by the pious Prince Constantine, Constantine the Great, the Roman emperor, the restrainer, Constantine, it is manifest, it is visibly apparent that God cannot be judged by man, unquote. Since the Pope is God, he cannot be judged by man. That's the official teaching of Roman Catholic canon law. It is the supreme law of the world and no man may counter Roman Catholic canon law. No state or government or any other authority on the earth or in heaven may gainsay the papacy. And he is regarded by the papacy, by the Roman Catholic Church, and is to be regarded by all his subjects as God on earth. All right, now I'll continue. They claim that no laws, not even their own canon laws, can bind the popes, but that just as Christ, being maker of all laws and ordinances, could violate the law of the Sabbath because he was Lord also of the Sabbath, so popes can dispense with any law to show that they are above all law. Now, this is a reference to when Jesus and the apostles were were hungry on the Sabbath, and they stopped to pick corn, grain, wheat. And they were observed by the religious leaders of the day. And they came to Jesus in the field and asked him, why do you break the law? There they were, condemning the supreme lawgiver of heaven and earth, Christ himself, and questioning him, why does he not observe the law? That he had broken the moral law of God by picking corn, or picking wheat, rather, on the Sabbath day. And he asserts that the papacy has the very same power that Christ did, because he, not Christ, but he, the Pope, is the Lord of the Sabbath. All right, now I'll continue. It is claimed that the chair of St. Peter, that is the papal throne, the see of Rome is, quote, made the head of the world, unquote, that it is not to be subject to any man, quote, since by the divine mouth, It is exalted above all, unquote. In the canon laws, the Roman pontiff is described as, quote, our Lord God, the Pope, unquote, and is said to be, quote, 
neither God nor man, but both, unquote. He's literally taking upon himself the attributes of Jesus Christ, both God and man. That's what the popes claim for themselves, that they are both God and man. This is a matter of Roman Catholic canon law. And to be under Roman Catholic canon law means you must believe this without any mental reservation, or you are ipso facto excommunicated from the church and destined for a Christless eternity. That's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, by now, you must be asking yourself, why has not your church, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher told you about the history of these popes? That's a very good question and one that we all should examine with a microscope. Now, he continues, he says, but the climax of assumption, the keystone of the arch of papal pretensions, is probably to be found in the celebrated extravagant, that is, the extraordinary utterance of Pope Boniface VIII. Pope Boniface VIII, the unum sanctum. Unum sanctum means one holy. It is a papal bull one of the most authoritative utterances a pope can issue, and it runs thus, quote, all the faithful of Christ by necessity of salvation are subject to the Roman pontiff who judges all men but is judged by no one, unquote. Quote, this authority is not human but rather divine. Therefore, we declare, assert, define, and pronounce that to be subject to the Roman pontiff is to every human creature altogether necessary for salvation, unquote. Now, in case you're a little like me and have a little trouble with the common English language, what is said by Pope or rather Antichrist Boniface VIII in his papal bull, Unum Sanctum, which as soon as he seals it with his apostolic ring, it becomes Roman Catholic canon law. It becomes equivalent to Scripture. And it says that every human being must be altogether under or subject to the Roman pontiff for salvation. If you're not a subject of the, of the Roman pope, heaven will not be your home. That's the official, the most authoritative teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And now you know what is so important about the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement, post-Vatican Council II, is putting into practice this law of the Pope, Unum Sanctum, that every human creature must be subject to the papacy as a necessity of salvation. That's the whole purpose behind Vatican Council II. And that's what the churches have done. They've, all the denominations are signing documents of agreement with the papacy, legally binding documents, making the papacy the supreme authority in their churches. That's what's happening right before our very eyes. This has been going on ever since Vatican Council II in 1965. Now, the author continues, he says, all these claims were incessantly and universally urged all down through the centuries by the popes of Rome and are still advanced as boldly as ever in official decretals, bulls, extravagance, decisions of canonists, sentences of judges, 
books, catechisms, sermons, and treatises of all kinds. There's no mistaking what they amount to. The Pope claims divine inspiration. His words are to be received as the words of God. No laws can bind him. He is supreme over all. The very scriptures themselves derive their authority from him, the papacy. Implicit, unquestioning obedience to him is the only way of salvation. He is exalted above all, supreme over all nations, kings, emperors, princes, bishops, archbishops, churches, over all the world. He is as God on earth, and as such, to be worshipped and obeyed. Let me quote you from his own lips some of the great words of the little horn of Daniel. The following language affords a mere sample of thousands of such papal blasphemies. Quote, The greatness of priesthood began in Melchizedek, was solemnized in Aaron, continued in the children of Aaron, perfected in Christ, represented in Peter, exalted in the universal jurisdiction, and manifested in the Pope so that through this preeminence of my priesthood, having all things subject to me, it may seem well verified in me that which was spoken of Christ. Quote, Thou hast subdued all things under his feet, sheep and oxen and all cattle of the field and birds of heaven and fish of the sea, etc., where it is to be noted that even oxen, Jews and heretics by cattle of the field, pagans be simple signified. By sheep and cattle are meant all Christians, all Christian men, both great and less, whether they be emperors, princes, prelates, or others. By birds of the air you may understand angels and potentates of heaven who be all subject to me in that I am greater than the power to bind and loose in heaven and to give heaven to them that fight in my wars. Lastly, by the fishes of the sea are signified the souls departed in pain or in purgatory. All the earth is my diocese, and I am the ordinary of all men, having the authority of the king of all kings upon subjects. I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, have but one consistory, one office, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. In all things that I list, my will is to stand For reason, for I am able by the law to dispense above the law and of wrong to make justice in correcting laws and changing them. Wherefore, if those things that I do be said not to be done of man but of God, what can you make of me but God? Again, if prelates of the church be called and and counted of Constantine for God's, I then, being above all prelates, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Therefore, no marvel if it be in my power to change times and times, to alter and abrogate laws. Does that remind anybody of any scriptures? That he will think to change times and laws? Look, the very words written in the scriptures attributed to Antichrist by the apostles and the prophets of God. The very words they used in the scriptures are repeated by this pope. This is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He says, wherefore, no marvel if it be in my power to change times and times, 
to alter and to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, yea, even with the precepts of Christ. For where Christ biddeth Peter put up his sword and admonishes his disciples not to use any outward force in revenging themselves, <laughs> excuse me. Let me start over. For where Christ biddeth Peter to put up his sword and admonishes his disciples not to use any outward force in revenging themselves, do not I, Pope Nicholas, writing to the bishops of France, exhort them to draw out their material swords? And whereas Christ was present himself at the marriage in Cana of Galilee, do not I, Pope Martin, in my distinction, inhibit the spiritual clergy to be present at marriage feasts and also to marry? Moreover, where Christ biddeth us lend without gain of hope, without hope of gain, excuse me, do not I, Pope Martin, give dispensation for the same? What should I speak of murder, making it to be no murder or homicide to slay them that be excommunicated? Here the Pope is arrogating to himself the divine authority to excommunicate and then to murder those that he excommunicates. And therein lies all the blood that has been shed on the earth, all the wars, all the inquisitions, all the crusades have been conducted under Roman Catholic canon law. He said, what should I speak of murder, making it to be no murder or homicide to slay them that be excommunicated? Listen, if the Pope damns you by calling you a heretic or an infidel, it is no murder to kill you, according to Roman Catholic canon law. And I will tell you, under the dictates of the Fourth Lateran Council, it's not only legal to kill you, it is a meritorious work. Roman Catholics receive grace of merit for killing a heretic. And that defines the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Crusades and the Inquisitions and the wars of the world. Now he says, likewise, against the law of nature, item against the apostles, also against the canons of the apostles, I can and do dispense. In other words, I can contradict the apostles. And he says, for where they in their canon command a priest for fornication to be deposed, I, through the authority of Pope Sylvester, do alter the rigor of that constitution, considering the minds and bodies also of men to be weaker than they were then. So the Pope can can excuse fornication and sodomy. And that's exactly why the Roman Catholic sodomite priests don't go to jail in this country. Do you realize that there are 4,500 cases of pedophile priests on the legal dockets in the courts of this country, according to a BBC report, a documentary released several years ago? 4,500 legal cases against pedophile priests in this country and the courts of this land, unless they get approval from the papacy, they cannot prosecute them. And it is up to the Roman Catholic Church to punish or not to punish those pedophile priests. Here we see the canons of the Roman Catholic Church demonstrated right before our very eyes. Now, if any of us were guilty or even accused of pedophilia, we would be hauled into hell itself by the court system. 
But let it be a Roman Catholic priest, and nine times out of ten, he goes free. Rome claims legal jurisdiction over its priests, and whatever judgment she decides to levy or not to levy, that becomes the law. And that priest just simply moves from diocese to diocese, from archdiocese to archdiocese, from nation to nation. And eventually, if the, if the authorities keep hounding him for his pedophilia, they literally put him up in the Vatican where no one can touch him. Prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes in the mainstream and alternative medias today, and no one seems to lay it to heart. But this is Roman Catholic canon law. When you see this kind of injustice, it comes from Roman Catholic canon law. It comes from the Pope who calls himself God on earth, and no man may defy his decrees. And if he chooses to let a pedophile priest go, he must be let go. Now, continue with this, this lengthy quote. Quote, after that, I have now sufficiently declared my power in earth, in heaven, in purgatory, how great it is, and what is the fullness thereof in binding, loosing, commanding, permitting, electing, confirming, deposing, dispensing, doing, and undoing, etc. I will speak now a little bit of my riches and of my great possessions, that every man may see my wealth and abundance of all things, rents, tithes, tributes. Let me just tell you, it's been admitted by a whistleblower of the World Bank that 60% of the federal taxes that you pay goes to the Roman Catholic Church. The IRS is the tax man for the Roman Catholic Church. Karen Hudes is her name, H-U-D-E-S. You can go to Google Video and watch her videos, and she'll tell you to your face that 60% of the federal taxes that you pay go to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this Pope's continuing to talk about his wealth, his rents, his tithes, his tributes, that's taxes. He continues to talk about my silks, my purple miters, scarlet and purple. He's telling you who he is. My purple miters, crowns, gold, silver, pearls, and gems lands and lordships for me for to me pertaineth first the imperial city of rome the the palace of the lateran the kingdom of sicily is proper to me apulia and capua be mine also the kingdom of england and ireland be they not or ought they not be tributaries to me To these I enjoin also, besides other provinces and countries, both in the Occident and the Orient, that is, the whole world, from the north to the south, these dominions by name. And here he gives a complete list of all the nations that he claims to own. Now, what should I speak here of my daily revenues? of my first fruits, annats, pauls, indulgences, bulls, confessionals, indults, and rescripts, testaments, dispensations, privileges, elections, prebends, religious houses, and such like, which come to no small mass of money. Whereby what vantage cometh to my coffers, it may be it may partly be conjectured. But what should I speak of Germany? When the whole world is my diocese, as my canonists do say, and all men are bound to believe, except they will imagine, as the Manichees do, two beginnings, which is false and heretical. For Moses said, in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth, and not in the beginnings. Therefore, as I began, 
So I conclude, commanding, declaring, and pronouncing to stand upon necessity of salvation for every human creature to be subject to me, unquote. And this quote was taken from Fox's Book of Martyrs, as it is known today. Originally, it was known as Acts and Monuments, Volume 4, page 145. Now, after this lengthy quote, could anyone question that the papacy has arrogated to himself all of the power and jurisdiction and authority of God himself? Have you ever heard more blasphemous words in your life? Did you even imagine such blasphemies? They're in writing. They are a matter of Roman Catholic canon law. And all the kings of the earth must obey those canon laws. Now, continuing, it says, it is futile to allege that the papacy does not make these claims and speak these great words against God, but in his name and as his representative. The answer is patent. This prophecy foretells what the power predicted would do, not what it would profess to do. Does the papacy give God the glory, or does it glorify itself? Facts cannot be set aside by false pretenses. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The head of a Christian church would not overtly array himself against God. If he does so, it would be under semblance of serving him. Now here the author gives us a note. He says, let us suppose a rebel in some distant province to forge the royal seal and handwriting and pretend to act in the name of the sovereign. He then claims to himself entire and unreserved allegiance. He abrogates whatever laws he pleases and enacts contrary ones in their, in their place. He enforces his own statutes by the severest punishments against those who still adhere to the old laws of the kingdom. He clothes himself with the robes of state, applies to himself the royal tithes, uh, excuse me, the royal titles, claims immunity from the laws, even his own laws of enacting, and pretends that all the statutes derive their sole force from his sanction and must borrow their meaning from his interpretation. Last of all, he banishes, strips of their goods, imprisons, and puts to death all those subjects who abide by the laws of the king and reject his usurpation. Surely in this case, the pretense of governing in the monarch's name does not excuse, but aggravates the rebellion. It lessens greatly, it is true, the guilt of the deceived subject, but increases in the same proportion the crime of the deceiver, unquote. This quote from Burke's work entitled The First Two Visions of Daniel, unquote, page 221. That author is simply describing the papacy as the antichrist of scripture. And let there be no mistake. Despite what they teach in the churches today, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture. If not, then the prophet Daniel was wrong. Then the apostle Paul was wrong. And the prophet John was wrong. And you just as well burn your Bible. That's the truth. And this truth was believed by all, virtually all, of the Protestant reformers. Without exception, they all claimed the papacy to be the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, continue at the top of page 52. The papacy has abundantly branded on her own brow this particular of the prophecy, 
the boastful, blasphemous claim to divine authority and absolute dominion. It has assumed divine attributes and even the very name of God, and on the strength of that name, claimed to be above all human judgment. And number five, the fifth point that this author makes, he says lawlessness was the next feature we noted in the little horn. We have given above some specimens of the papal claim to set aside all laws, divine and human. Quote, the Pope has also annulled the only surviving law of paradise, confirmed by the words of Christ. The Lord ordained, quote, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. The Pope ordains, quote, We decide also that, according to the sacred canons, the marriages contracted by priests and deacons be dissolved, and the parties brought to do penance, unquote. The papacy has further annulled the second commandment, giving on the mount by given on the mount by the lips of God himself in theory by the childish and false distinction between heathen idols and christian images and in practice by hiding it from the people and blotting it out from the catechisms of the general instruction now let me explain what the author is saying here The Roman Catholic Church, in all of its official teachings, completely leaves out the second commandment. That forbidding the making and bowing down to and praying to images and idols. Roman Catholicism teaches that that prohibition in in the law of God was against pagan Rome and all the imagery and idolatry that was seen in the pagan Roman Empire. But after the popes replaced the Caesars, and the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire, that all those very same images and idols that were called idolatry in the pagan Roman Empire now become sanctified by the papacy, And it is legal and meritorious and is a matter of good Catholic practice to bow down, bend the knee, and pray and worship the images and idols of the Roman Catholic Church. That makes it the church of idolatry. The thing that God most despised about the Israelites when they bowed down and worshipped images and idols in the groves and the high places in Israel where they built shrines and altars to the queen of heaven, and the women baked cakes to the queen of heaven. They were constantly trying to replace the real creator of heaven and earth by images and idols. They tried to worship him through them, just like the Roman Catholic Church does today. And they were consistently, repeatedly, and bitterly punished by God for that very reason. And here we have now the largest so-called Christian church of the world setting the example for every heathen nation to bow down and worship images and idols. And they call it a Christian church. When they literally completely eliminate the second commandment from the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. This is another example how the Pope can change times and laws, can abrogate laws, even the precepts of Christ. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Why look to the future for an Antichrist when he's been with us all along? He says the Pope has further annulled the main laws of the gospel. He forbids the cup to the laity, although the Lord himself has commanded, quote, drink ye all of it, unquote. Now, many people don't realize this, but in the Roman Catholic Mass, the priest drinks the wine and the people eat the Jesus cookie. 
the people are not to partake of the wine. When Jesus said distinctly, drink ye all of it, that the wine is reserved for the priests. Another distinction of the Antichrist Church of Rome, changing the very laws of Christ himself, the precepts of Christ, when he gave us the elements of communion, bread and wine, to take the place of what the Jews formerly practiced was was, uh, the Passover, he gave them bread and wine as a remembrance of his body and his blood. But Rome says no. They will partake of the bread, but not the wine. He continues, he says, he, speaking of the papacy, he forbids the people of Christ in general to use the word of God in their own tongue. Though Christ himself had charged them, quote, search the scriptures. Well, how do you search the scriptures unless you can read it for yourself? But Rome says, no, the scriptures must be in the holy language of Latin. And even though no one on the earth could read and understand the Latin language, that is the language of the Bible, and it's not for man to read and to understand the Scriptures. It's not for man to search the Scriptures for himself, but to be spoon-fed by a diabolical Roman Catholic priest. And that's why, during the power, the height of the Roman Catholic Church's power in the world, that's why it was called the Dark Ages. The gospel was unknown to the people. The Bible was unknown to the people. Only the priests, and even very few of them, could read Latin. And anyone caught with the scriptures in their own tongue was regarded a heretic, burned at the stake, and their Bible was burned right along with them. Whole whole cities were wiped out because they possess the scriptures in their own language. He continues, he says, he, speaking of the papacy again, he forbids the laity to reason or converse on the doctrines of the gospel. Though St. Peter has commanded them, quote, be ye ready to give a reason of the hope that is in you, unquote. And the the Pope finally sanctions and invocations of saints and angels, though St. Paul has warned us, quote, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, though St. John has renewed the charge to the disciples of Christ, quote, little children, keep yourselves from idols, unquote. And an angel from heaven renews the caution in his words, to the same holy apostle, quote, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Worship God, unquote. Rome says no. Worship the Pope. You are to call him Holy Father, your eminence. You are to bow down on your face and worship him, kiss his ring and kiss his feet. And you are to obey his every command without thought or reservation of any kind. That's what Roman Catholic canon law says. Now do you know why they call him the man of sin, the man of lawlessness? He truly is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Point number six, before we run out of time, systematic and long-continued persecution of the saints is one of the most marked features of the little horn of the prophecy of Daniel. It is predicted that he should, quote, wear out the saints of the Most High, unquote. His first great characteristic is blasphemous opposition to God. His next salient feature is oppressive cruelty towards men. And just as Christ allowed his people to suffer 10 persecutions under the pagan emperors of Rome, so he allowed his faithful witnesses to be worn out by the cruelties of papal Rome. Quote, they shall be given into his hand, unquote. 
The church has to tread in the footsteps of Christ himself, who resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and was put to death by the power of Rome. She is called to the fellowship of his sufferings, and while they secured the salvation of our race, hers have not been unfruitful, for the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But we must compare the facts of history with the prediction of prophecy on this point to see how deeply this mark is engraved on the papacy and upon no other power that has ever existed in the earth that the Church of Rome and her papal head have persecuted largely and long, none can pretend to deny. In fact, so far from denying it, Rome glories in it and regards it as one of her great merits. She boasts about persecuting the saints of Almighty God. Other nations have now abandoned as unsound, quote, the bloody tenet of persecution, unquote. But Rome retains it still, approves it theoretically, and would carry it out as vigorously as ever practiced, as practiced if she could. Other powers have persecuted to a small extent and occasionally in the past, but never systematically and by law throughout the ages. All but Rome now holds religious liberty to be an inherent right of man. Rome has, on the other hand, persecuted on principle and steadily from the 7th century right to the French Revolution and to some extent, almost to the present time. And I'll remind the listeners now, he's talking about the late 1800s. This book was written in 1876. It was, a, it was written to record the lectures that he gave live to standing room only audiences in England. He continues now, he says, she does so still in the secret recesses of her nunneries and monasteries under the name of penance. He's talking about torture. Okay? That's what goes on in the monasteries and the nunneries of the Roman Catholic Church. Torture of disobedient nuns and, and monks if they defy the papacy. It says, where else does she require shops for the sale of instruments of bodily torture, such as exist this day in London? Yes, Rome is the one who perfected torture and built the instruments of torture. Designed and built the instruments of torture for the Inquisitions. And then gave those instruments of torture to the civil governments over which he ruled to put heretics to death, even monks and nuns if they defied the Pope. Rome doesn't even spare her own people. Now, Rome's contention is not that she does not persecute, but only that she does not persecute saints. Now, let me tell you this about this little loophole. In the Roman Catholic Church, you cannot be a saint until you're canonized by the church, by the Pope. And you cannot be canonized by the Pope unless you're dead. See how cynical Rome is? Let me read it again. Why else does the Roman Catholic Church require shops for the sale of instruments of bodily torture such as exist this day in London? Rome's contention is not that she does not persecute, but only that she does not persecute saints. She does not persecute dead people. That's who she regards as saints. But let me tell you something. There are many instances in history where the papacy has dug up heretical popes, heretical Protestants from the grave. Those who have been dead for decades have dug them up out of the ground, put them on trial for heresy, and then burned their bones and thrown them in the river. 
she even persecutes the dead. He continues, he says, she punishes heretics. A very different thing. The first would be wicked. The last she esteems laudable. In the Remish New Testament, there is a note on the words, quote, drunken with the blood of the saints, unquote, which runs as follows, quote, Protestants foolishly expound this of Rome because heretics are there put to death. But their blood is not called the blood of saints any more than the blood of thieves or man-killers or other malefactors. And for the shedding of it, no commonwealth shall give account, unquote. You kill a heretic, you, not, you, you must be commended. And he says, this is clear. Rome approves the murder of heretics and fully admits that she practices her principles. The question, therefore, becomes this. Are those whom Rome calls heretics the same as those who Daniel calls saints? If so, the identification of the papacy is as complete in this respect as in all the previous points. In order to arrive at an answer to this question, let us take Rome's own definition of a heretic. The following statements are from the authorized documents, laws, and decrees of the papacy, dating from the time of Pope Pelagius in the 6th century, 1,200 years ago. Quote, schism is an evil. Whoever is separated from the apostolic see, that is from the papacy, is doubtless in schism. Do then what we often exhort. Take pains that they who presume to commit this sin be brought into custody. Do not hesitate to compress men of this kind, and if he despise this, let him be crushed by the public powers, unquote. In other words, let him be, be crushed, killed by the government or the king in the, of the nation in which he lives. Continuing, he says, this, it will be observed, makes a want of perfect submission to the Pope, even though no false doctrine or evil practice be alleged, a ground for persecution. Pope Damasus, whose election to the pontificate was secured by 137 murders, authorized persecution of those who speak against any of the holy canons, and adds, quote, it is permissible neither to think nor to speak differently from the Roman church, unquote. This is one of the canons which it is blasphemy to violate, and he who ventures to differ, even in thought, on any point whatsoever from the Roman church, is therefore a heretic. Hundreds of decisions on detailed examples of heresy are all summed up in this one. The Roman, decrees every, the Roman decrees everywhere supply similar definitions. Whatever is short of absolute, unconditional surrender of all freedom of act or word or even thought and conscience is heresy. Every evangelical Christian in the world is therefore, according to Romanists, according to Roman Catholic canon law, a heretic and as such, liable to the punishment. Death. And moreover, Rome frankly admits that it is only where she cannot, in the nature of things, carry out her ecclesiastical discipline that she is justified in refraining from persecution. In other words, Everywhere she is prevented from doing this, she's justified not to persecute. But as soon as she can change the laws and make religious persecution the law of the land, it is her divine right, her divine prerogative, her divine responsibility to kill all heretics. He says the papacy teaches all her adherents that it is a sacred duty to exterminate heresy. 
From age to age, it has sought to crush out all opposition to its own dogmas and corruptions, and papal edicts for persecution are innumerable. The Fourth Lateran Council, which I referred to earlier, the Fourth Lateran Council issues a canon on the subject, which subsequently became an awful instrument of cruelty. For long ages it was held and taught universally that whoever fell fighting against heretics, whoever died trying to kill a heretic, had merited heaven. Pope Urban II issued a decree acted on, alas, to this day in Ireland, that the murder of heretics was excusable. Quote, we do not count them murderers who, burning with the zeal of their Catholic mother against the excommunicated, may happen to have slain some of them, unquote. If not absolutely murdered, heretics might be ill-treated ad libitum. In other words, at any time, by any means, by whomever, according to the ordinance of Pope Gregory IX, who writes to the Archbishop of Milan, quote, let those understand themselves to be absolved, the debt of fidelity, homage, and all manner of service who were bound by any compact, however firmly ratified, to those who have fallen into heresy, unquote. In other words, if you were ever adjudged a heretic by the papacy, every contract you ever signed, every agreement that you ever made with your fellow Christian, every Every league that you made in your life was null and void. Even your title to property. Systematic persecution and extermination of heretics among their subjects was constant and enjoined, constantly enjoined. In other words, constantly forced upon the kings and the emperors. Such were required solemnly to swear on their coronation that they would, according to their power, faithfully render their service to the Pope, which meant they must kill the heretics. If the Pope says he must die, he's a heretic, then the king of the land was had a moral, spiritual obligation to the God of this world to kill that so-called heretic. If they neglected to do it, the sovereign pontiff would declare the vassals free of their uh, free and give their realms to rigid papists who would be more effectually who would more effectually persecute. In other words, if a king decided that he wasn't going to kill any more Bible believing Christians for the Pope, the Pope just simply threw him out of office, or had him killed, or relieved all of his subjects from obedience to him and declared an interdict, closed all the churches until he would force the civilians of the nation to overthrow the government. And then the Pope would put someone in who would obey him. If monarchs became heretics themselves, they were to be deposed and anathematized. In other words, damned to hell. Thus, Pope Pius V, quote, issued a bull for the damnation and excommunication of Protestant Queen Elizabeth and her adherents, unquote, cutting her off from, quote, the unity of the body of Christ, unquote, depriving her of her crown and her kingdom and pronouncing a curse on her and on all who continued to obey her. That's the history of the Roman papacy. And churches all over this world that call themselves Christians say he is the great spiritual leader of Christianity today. Unthinkable. If the Protestant reformers were alive to see the apostasy in the evangelical churches today, they would not turn in their graves. They would leap to life, jump out of their graves, and stone us all. That concludes the first hour of the program. 
I'll now turn it over for discussion. Thanks for listening. My name is Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Tune in Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time, and I'll turn it over for discussion now. Thanks for listening.